hi guys hi welcome welcome back to another video welcome back to my old subscribers and welcome to my new subscribers i greet you all in the mighty name of jesus christ our soon coming king hope you guys are having a wonderful day so far a wonderful evening a wonderful morning whenever you have stumbled across this video so in today's video i will be doing yet again another book review and it is this book by Derek prince it's called lucifer exposed the devil's plan to destroy your life but before i get into this review i'm just gonna read a scripture for you and it's taken from the book of joel chapter 2 verse 20 i will read all the way up to probably um 30 or 31 you know what let me just read joel chapter 2 verses 28 to 30 two <clears throat> it says here the lord's promise of his spirit then after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. And I will cause wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For some on Mount Zion in Jerusalem will escape, just as the Lord has said. These will be among the survivors whom the Lord has called. And that's it. Um... Joel chapter 2 verses 28 to 32. I'll just put the scripture reading on the bottom of the screen there. So that's it. As it says, you know, the Lord says, in the last days, he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And this is what is happening now. God is pouring out his spirit who is the Holy Spirit on everyone. You know, the spirit of the Lord is convicting are convicting the hearts of people the only thing is that some people instead of listening or wanting to come to god they are running away so let me just put this one side and let me get into this book review let me see if i can zoom in a bit hopefully my um camera or phone doesn't move so this is the book that i'll be reviewing tonight as i said before it's called lucifer exposed the devil's plan to destroy your life by Derek prince i've done a few reviews on various books by Derek prince before and i'll put um i'll put i think it's blessings or curse you choose and I think I've done another one. Yeah, I did another one, which is a Bible study one. You know, I really do love using or reading books by Derek Prince because he, he was a solid, solid teacher in the word of God. And this is what the body is missing. Solid teachers. There are too many showmen and showwomen in the churches today. You know, no one wants to... Um, everyone is fighting or trying to entertain the congregation, but you know, that is not what God wants. God wants us as people to, to know things, to understand things and to be taught. And that is why he appointed, you know, teachers, etc. But a lot of people don't want to be teachers, you know, but as I said, let me just move on so this is the back of the book here and it says here the fall of lucifer set up the battle of the ages you are positioned right in the midst of this historic struggle and on the back it says here satan the fallen archangel desires nothing more than to win the loyalty hearts and minds of the entire human race and he won't quit in his attempt to win over you 
and then here it tells you sorry if you can see the reflection of my ring light etc it says here lucifer expose reveals these shocking facts why lucifer chose to attack god why satan is no longer called lucifer how we enter how we enticed sorry one third of the angels to follow him what causes christians to be led astray by him how to disarm is this evil adversary and then it goes on to tell us that prince exposes satan's greatest weapon in enslaving the average human into bondage Satan attempts to seduce Christians from rising to their full potential and to distract every human being from following God. Are you or someone you know struggling with abuse, pornography, addiction, gluttony or other issues? Use the mighty spiritual warfare rep weapons Sorry, revealed in this compelling book and victory can be yours. And then that's Derek Prince there. It tells you, you know, he has been the author of over 50 books. And then towards the back, <coughs> I'll show you or I'll, you'll see some of the books that he has written. And that's the ISBN number. This book, I bought this from Amazon. I think it was sometime last year. And I'm just getting um, the opportunity to read it now. It's not a big book, as you can see. It's well, <coughs> sorry about that. <coughs> I think I'm, I'm, don't, not, I'm not sure what's happening, but it's small enough to hold in like a handbag or something like that. So you can just take it with you on the bus, on the train, you know, to have a read. It's not a lot of chapters. It's only six chapters. And then that's the inside of it. Basically the same thing like what most books have. It has like the ISBN number, the copyright, etc. And then if you want to dig more deep and see more work about Derek Prince, that's his ministry. That's the ministry there. And he also has, you know, very, there are also various teachings, etc. on YouTube that you can go ahead and watch as well. And then here we have the contents and then that's it. These are the only six chapters or invisible enemies. Chapter one, the battle lines are drawn warfare against the kingdom of darkness, <clears throat> the power of the cross, the nature of witchcraft, the work of the cross. And then at the back, it tells you about the author, the books of Derek Prince and Derek Prince worldwide offices. So as you can see, it's not a very big book. That's it. That's what it is. That's how thick the book is. So let me just get into it because I'm trying my best not to make this video very long. Although sometimes, you know, if you have watched reviews, book reviews, Bible reviews, etc. I tend to go on and on and on and on and on, you know. But, you know, it's all good anyway. So that's it. And these are just some stickers that I made for myself. This week, I think I was going sticker, man, sticker crazy, not really sticker crazy, but I was just making some stickers, practicing to make stickers, you know, that I like. So I quite like how they, I really loved how they turned out at my, you know, I was just sitting there and the Lord was just basically ministering to me with regards to how I can change up some of the designs because I do sell stickers as well so this one was the first one and then I went and tried something else like give it a bit of color at the back but let me get on into it and then that's another sticker that I did and then that one as well it says peace and God's masterpiece and that's who you are you are God's masterpiece so this is chapter one, our invisible enemies. And it says here, O, fo o foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And as you know, Galatians was written by the Apostle Paul. So Paul was saying, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you, you Galatians, that you do not believe the truth? And we can even look into it and apply it now in the world today. Who has bewitched the world? that they do not believe the truth and the simple truth is it is our invisible enemy it is the devil himself who has bewitched the world so that we do not obey the truth and basically he goes on to give a little a brief background as to like who our invisible enemies are etc etc 
and then he was going deep into it and it says here invisible enemies it is a very dangerous situation to have powerful and active enemies working against you and not even be aware that you have those enemies as christian the enemies we face are not persons of flesh and blood they are invisible spirit beings the theme we are going to deal with in this book concern matters that are not discerned by human senses. And that is it. The Bible tells us that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. And because we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, we cannot approach this enemy on a physical um, a physical perspective. Why? Because our enemy is invisible. So therefore... We, any battle we're fighting, we have to take it to the realms of the spirit. And this is where now we need to lean so heavily on the Holy Spirit who is going to help us in our battles that are coming and will be coming. Because once you become a child of God, let me tell you, you are basically marked. Why? Because you have been transported from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and basically it just tells you about our invisible enemies etc etc and it tells you about the morning star which as you know when you read in the book of isaiah it explains it says here in isaiah 14 we are introduced to a being called lucifer in its latin root the word Lucifer means the one who brings light. Remember also the scripture tells us that the devil masquerades as an angel of light. So he pretends to be light, but he is not. He is pure darkness. And then it just goes on to explain about um, the morning star, etc. And then this is just a setup really to who our invisible enemies are. And how, you know, in terms of how our invisible enemies attack us. And um, let me just try and flip through. So this is basically going into it in terms of the pride of Lucifer, the fall of Lucifer, etc. And it tells us here, Lucifer's pride. Returning to Ezekiel 28, we see precisely what caused Lucifer's downfall. And it tells us here, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And that is it. Pride. This is why in the Bible, the Lord hates pride. The Lord hates pride. Why? Because when you are so proud, you see you have no need for God. You think that you can do it all by yourself. And this is it because, you know, the enemy was looking and looking at his beauty and what he was made up of and all the bug. You know, the Bible gives such a, a description. I don't think even we can imagine, you know, how he looked back then. But it tells us the, the various stones that set up, the precious stones that made him up and, you know, looking, just trying to imagine it, you would say that must have been what a beautiful sight to look at and that is it he saw how beautiful or how magnificently created he was and got haughty and full of pride and thinking that well he can be like god you know it's just like if you are a parents and you are the one who brought the child on the earth but yet still your child is going to try and overthrow you to say well no i can run this house much better than you you know so basically is something in this scenario so this chapter one just goes into it and tells you how who our invisible enemies are how is it they came to be their invisible enemies and the 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 leader of the in our invisible enemies and then here it tells us that the battle lines are drawn. Now Satan stood up against Israel. And then it goes on to say here that Lucifer was perhaps the wisest and most beautiful of all God's creation. But scripture says his heart was lifted up 
after growing proud because of his wisdom and his beauty, and after hatching his planned rebellion against God, he was cast down from the presence of God and his treacherous angels were cast down with him. So now the battle lines are drawn and this is why the scripture tells us that woe to the inhabitants of the earth because, you know, the devil has come down with great anger. He has come down with great anger. And the thing is this, because the devil knows that he cannot attack God, he will attack us. Why? Because we are made in the image of God and he knows how much God loves us. And this is why we are facing the attacks time and time again. Why? Because the enemy is trying to wear us out. But this is where now we need to be getting in and reading books reading the bible reading other books that have been written by anointed men and women of god you know to help us in our journey in terms of walking with the lord and sometimes when our faith gets shaken that it won't basically crumble you know our faith will but get, as I said before, get shaken a little bit, but we will still be standing. Why? Because our foundation is built on Jesus Christ. Our foundation is built, what? On the word of God and nothing else. And here it tells you God's alternative plan. And then it goes on to say Satan's counterattack. So basically, that's what chapter two is all about. Still lower. How would God now respond to the fall of Adam? So it spoke about in the beginning, you know, when the serpent tempted um, Eve and she yielded to the temptation and then she gave the fruit to Adam, etc. So it's basically setting it up to say our invisible enemy who who that person is or who that individual is and then it now since the battle lines are drawn and then i'm just gonna go on one sacrifice the sacrificial death of jesus on the cross is the only basis for god's provision for every need of the human race instead of god doing a lot of different actions at different times scripture says by offering sacrifice by one offering which is one sacrifice i.e jesus christ he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified so he when you come to christ he because you have accepted jesus christ as your personal lord and savior no we are being perfected because why we are being sanctified we are being made holy in the sight of god himself and let me try and skip on to chapter three it speaks about the way out. god offers a way out of satan's kingdom and into god's kingdom this is so vivid for me, i.e. Derek Prince is saying that. And then he goes on to speak about, you know, and I love this analogy that he gave. And let me try and see if I can find it where he says, um, he says here, he was speaking, said, um, I think he was saying that when he was in Zambia, and speaking to some people, he was giving an analogy, like if they want to get to the other side of the river, you know, what would happen? And they said that, well, there needs to be built a bridge and that bridge now takes them to the other side of the river. And he said, yes, that is true. And here it says here, God has provided a bridge. There is only one bridge, the cross of Jesus Christ. By taking that bridge, you can cross out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of God's love. God doesn't simply want us to stay on the bridge. He wants us to get into another kingdom and rule with Jesus now as kings and priests. That is our destination. So God, when you, when you are about to catapult, are being catapulted from the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of light you have to cross that bridge and that bridge is what the cross jesus christ is that bridge but some of us instead of wanting to cross over into the kingdom of light 
we are on that bridge same way this is what Derek prince is saying we're still on that bridge why are we on that bridge when we have been given the freedom to cross over onto the other side and then he said here here is the problem with the Christian church. We have millions and millions of people who have gotten out of the kingdom of darkness, but they are still hanging around on the bridge. They have never moved over into the kingdom of God. Lots of people say, I'm saved and that's it. It's a wonderful thing to be saved, but it is, but that is not the end. The bridge is just the way from one kingdom to another. The New Testament teaches that through redemption by the blood of Jesus, God has made us kings and priests in the here and now. And that is it. Some people, as he says here, some people are just happy to be saved, but they never experience the freedom. They never experience the fullness that God has in store for us, or that God, through Jesus Christ, through that sacrificial death on the cross. We, some of us never experienced that true freedom. Why? Because we're just stuck on the bridge to say, I'm saved, and then that's it. And it goes on to say, what did Jesus accomplish? And um, removing the barrier. I'm just flipping through, actually, because I'm mindful of the time. And here it says here, living in freedom. And as I said earlier, you know, some are happy to be saved. However, God wants us to be not. Yes, we are saved, but God wants us to experience the freedom that the death on, of Jesus Christ on the cross has brought for us. Remember, we were once slaves to sin, but now we are free. The scripture tells us that who the son sets free is free indeed. And is only the son can set the slaves free. Why? Because the son is the master's child and the son has authority over the, to set the slaves free. And basically that's it and then chapter three it speaks about warfare against the kingdom of darkness and then here it says here um in ephesians 3 ephesians 6 sorry 13 it says that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and have all and have done sorry all to stand and this is about speaking about the armor you know, the armor of God, the breastplate, the helmet, the taking up the sword, the belt, the, the shoes, etc. This specifically speaks about the armor of God. And it says, in the matter of spiritual warfare, Christ has clearly won the victory. However, he leaves us to enforce that victory. It is very important that we understand this. And that is it. The victory has already been won. So we now need to operate and walk in a way that we realize and understand that we are not defeated. Why? Because we are on the Lord's side. You know, we are no longer slaves to sin. We are no more in shackles, etc., we are now free. We are free because Christ has set us free. And it says here, it speaks about the armor, defensive armor. And then it just goes in to speak about the various parts of the armor. And then it says here about the nature of strongholds. And then it speaks about the weapons God has given us are mighty for pulling down strongholds or fortresses. Whose fortress are we pulling down? Satan's. And in what realm? The realm of the mind. And that is it. It is a battlefield for the mind because that is where the enemy operates in the mind. And Derek Prince goes on to say that Satan builds many different fortresses in people's mind. But if I, I were to choose one word to sum them all up, it would be the word prejudice. Prejudice means having your mind made up before you know the facts. And then here I wrote, we form an, opin an opinion based on what we perceive. Perception starts in the mind. And this is what we see going on around us now. 
There's so much prejudice in the world. And where does it start? It starts in the mind. And anything that starts off in the mind, we know the enemy is at play because he attacks the mind. There's a battlefield going on for our mind. See, it tells you here. The battlefield is the mind. And then you have the nature of the weapon. So he breaks down the different weapons in the armor. So you have the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, <clears throat> the shoes of the gospel, shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and then the sword of the spirit, which often, of course, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. And then he goes on to say the seventh weapon when we analyze this list of six items of equipment, we see that essentially they are defensive weapons, all except the sword. The sword is an offensive because you use it, you know, to inflict, inflict um, whether it is a wound or whatever on someone. And then he speaks about the seventh weapon. It says, Prayer is our means of breaking out of the restrictions of reaching only as far as our arm will extend. Prayer is limitless. In the weapon of prayer, there are three main components to do the job. The word of God, which is the logos, the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. So prayer is our seventh, as it says here, our seventh weapon. And as he says, prayer has no limit. Prayer is not confined to a particular area. So you can be wherever you are located. And if you have a family member or a friend or a loved one somewhere on the other side of the world, you can pray for that person. And the Lord will act based on your prayer. So prayer has no limits. And then here it speaks about our need for God's power. Then it speaks about the climax of our spiritual battle. And then we have the most powerful secret. And then it goes in to speak about redemption, cleansing, justification. It is a really good read. It's small, as I said before. But the information that is in this book is very vital. And then here, chapter 4, it speaks about the power of the cross. And then I'll read this. It says here, through this work <coughs> on the cross, Jesus administered a total, eternal, irrevocable defeat to Satan and his kingdom. This is the good news of the kingdom. And why Satan obscures the cross and then it goes in to tell you a bit more detail as to why is it, you know, the enemy wants to deny or wants people to deny the egg that, that Jesus died on the cross and that he raised, he was raised from the dead, you know, and the reasons for it. It tells you here the second reason and then. I'm trying to see the first reason, but I can only pick up the second reason. It says the second reason the enemy wants to obscure the power of the cross is that it was the means of Satan's total defeat. And basically that's it. And then you have the third reason. Satan obscures the power of the cross is that it is the only source of power for real Christian living. Some Christians and popular psychologists are fond of quoting the Sermon of the, on the Mount as the way people ought to live. As good as that sermon was, the only way we get the ability to live in the manner it describes is through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Jesus' sacrifice dealt with the old man, the fleshly nature. And basically that is it. God is good. I'm telling you, God is good. When you look and see what God has done through Jesus Christ for us, the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross, what he has done for us, we cannot help but worship him and glorify him for what he has done. 
and then it goes on to speak about legalism you know and um basically that's it and then it speaks about the nature of witchcraft and then it goes into say what witchcraft is and how it is upper how it operates and how people operate under witchcraft it speaks about intimidation and manipulation you know it spoke about jezebel and delilah in the script who manipulated you know jezebel with ahab and delilah with samson basically delilah manipulated um samson where she said well you don't love me because you are not telling me this and it says that sometimes even we women we tend to do that to our husbands we tend to manipulate them in order to get them to do what it is we want but what the book here is saying what Derek prince here is saying is that basically that is witchcraft and it speaks about husbands who use intimidation to intimidate the family so that the family will be kept in line, so to speak, you know. And Derek Prince says also intimidation is a form of witchcraft and we must stop it. And he goes on to say that even sometimes churches, the leaders, witchcraft has come into the church. The spirit of Jezebel has come into the churches because why the leaders people are using intimidation and manipulation against the people against the congregants against the church members in order to get them to do what it is they want to do when you look at what is happening now when you see so many sermons and you know exposure that god is exposing god is cleaning up his house you know you see some of these pastors they use intimidation as well as manipulation they play on people's um kindness etc in order to get them to do things but what the bible is saying that is witchcraft in itself and then here it says here three expressions of witchcraft in the flesh and he goes on to say that the three key words are dominate manipulate and intimidate the end purpose is control or the need to dominate. And that is it. Witchcraft is all about controlling, controlling the people, keeping people quiet, letting people be conformed to your way of thinking. And then he was going on to say witchcraft can be found in mothers and fathers too. And that's what, you know, and he even said that with regards to uh, when children they even know about manipulation from a very young age why because we have inherited the sin nature of adam the first man and then it goes on to speak about biblical examples which i said earlier is delilah and jezebel and then it goes on to say witchcraft's supernatural aspects it says here we must recognize that not all spiritual manifestations come from God. And that is true. Because sometimes when we see these spiritual manifestations, we often say, oh yeah, that is God. That definitely is from God. But here, what did I write? I said, this is why we need to ask the Lord to gift us with the spirit of discernment. Why? Because when we have the spirit of discernment, we'll be able to discern so to speak whether or not that is from god or whether or not that is not from god because let us not forget that the devil can also work can do miraculous things remember in egypt when moses went to egypt and with the snake what happened didn't pharaoh's magicians also threw their staff down and they their staff also turned into snakes but the thing about it is that god moses's staff his snake so to speak he ate up pharaohs so we know that our god is more powerful in any way but we must remember is not everything that we see is from god we must always that is why the bible says we need to test the spirit ask the father is this from you lord and believe me he will tell you he will tell you why because he do not want us to be deceived 
and um basically in a nutshell this just goes in to tell you the different aspects of witchcraft where you have divination and sorcery etc and then it tells you that witchcraft produces illegitimate um authority so it gives you um an example between with abraham with ishmael and isaac and it says here um witchcraft promotes the carnal and suppresses the supernatural in terms of Old Testament patterns, witchcraft puts Ishmael over Isaac. That is precisely what Islam has done. Islam teaches that Abraham did not sacrifice Isaac, but Ishmael. Muslims believe that Ishmael is the appointed heir. That is witchcraft putting Ishmael over Isaac. Of course, there are a lot more Ishmaels than this one example from islam anything we do of our own initiative which is not initiated by god through the holy spirit will be an ishmael so basically anything that we are operating outside of god outside of the initiation or the prompting of the holy spirit we know it's saying it is not it is an ishmael because remember Ishmael wasn't the promised child. It was who? It was Isaac. It was Isaac. And it was because Sarah was prompting Abraham, out, which is outside of what God said, outside of the promised seed. And what happened? Ishmael came and in the end, what happened? You know, Agar and Ishmael were sent away. So this is it. And it says here that the moment we try to start something that isn't initiated by God, we are going to produce an Ishmael. And a lot of us, a lot of us, myself included, have done things. When you look back on it, things that God was not in the center of it. God wasn't in it at all. And why? But what this is saying is that, Ishmael wasn't the promised. So whatever we have done outside of the will of God is not what God has promised us. So we have ended up producing an Ishmael. And then it speaks about theology over revelation, education over discipline, psychology over discernment. So other ways of, you know, how witchcraft operates. And then it says programs over supernatural. And I especially like this one. It says here, witchcraft exalts program over supernatural direction. The apostles never came up with a program for evangelizing Judea. They were simply sent out by the Holy Spirit. There was no program for sending Philip to Samaria. He just ended up there and the results followed. And basically what this is saying what did I write? I said here, too many churches are all about sticking to their service instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to lead. And this is what he is saying. There are times when the Spirit of the Lord wants to move within a church, but then you have the churches, they say, okay, well, church is only for two hours. We're going to do notices for 15 minutes. Then we're going to do worship for, say, another hour, 45 minutes, whatever. And then the sermon is going to be that. So they have just stuck to a particular box and there is no wiggle room so when the spirit of the lord now wants to move within that church move within that sermon there's no discernment the supernatural direction has just been put aside why because they're more interested in sticking to their programs and then you have eloquence over supernatural power and eloquence mean your education you value your education you know we and then this is now when you say well logic does not say this but when it comes to the things of god you can't be speaking about logic and then it says reasoning over faith this is the same thing as logic legalism over love and i'm currently here which is chapter six the work of the cross so i'll be reading this tomorrow in order to finish up and in a nutshell this is what this book is all about i love this it says three um sorry three freedoms freedom from condemnation freedom to love and freedom to be led by the holy spirit so this is what 
as a, a byproduct, so to speak, what the cross has achieved, our freedom. We have been freed. We are free. No more condemnation. Why? Because you are in Christ Jesus. As it says here in Romans 8. There, therefore, sorry. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And that's it. Because we are no children of God. We are free from condemnation. Because this is what the devil does. He comes and condemns you and condemns you. And just make, and it starts off, as it says here in the first part of the book, it is a battlefield for the mind. But when you know who you are in Christ Jesus, when you are able to pick up your armor and withstand, withstand the assaults of the enemy, you will come to the realization exactly what the cross, what the work of the cross is all about. Boat. and that's it in a nutshell my brothers and sisters i thank you so very much for sticking around to this video i'm looking at it now and it's now 41 minutes i always say i'm gonna try and cut these reviews down to probably 20 minutes but it never seemed to work out you know but it's all good anyway you know we just have to follow the leading of the spirit of the lord and where he wants me to go in terms of explanation of whatever book or whatever video i've put out and as i said before i'll just be showing you some more um books so this is these are other books that derek prince have written he has written a lot i'm telling you he has written a lot, a lot of books. And these are it. And this is the one that I currently have. I think I did a review of it. Yes, I did actually. Self-study, Bible course. And then there's another one, Blessing or Curse, You Can Choose. And I think I've done another. I have another book as well. And I think I have this one, Prayers and Proclamations. And I think there's another one I have. I can't, I don't remember. But this is the end of this review. Is it a lovely book? Of course it is. Why? Because then you will know how the enemy is operating in your life. And the, some of the tactics that the enemy will use in order to get into your mind. And not only that, when you are seeing it operating in the church or in the world on our old, in people that you know, you know, you'll be able to, discern through the help of the holy spirit what is in operation and i say thank you all yet again for sticking around to this video at least i hope you have stuck around for this long and i say my people my brothers and sisters get into the habit of reading the word of god get into the habit of spending time in the presence of the lord get into the habit of getting to know who your heavenly father is, the one who created you, the one who has called you from darkness into light. And as always, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the countenance of the Lord forever rest upon you and give you peace. And I say, shalom, shalom, shalom. And have a wonderful day, everyone. A wonderful morning, a wonderful evening, a wonderful night. Whenever you have stumbled across this video. And as always, God bless you all. And remember, God loves you. God loves you so so very much to the point that he sent his only begotten son you know to die on the cross for you and for me so we could come and spend eternity with him have a blessed day everyone bye